Well, the thing about being on a lot of boards is what you get used to doing after a while is speaking at great length and with perceived authority about things you don't know very much about, <laughs> which is what I'm going to do now. Uh, I'm going to start off, oh, I'm not Powder Matt. Can I get the slides up, please? <laughs> there we go. Um, no, I'm going to talk about the other side of climate change. Uh, I'm a big supporter of Protect Our Winners. I want to say that right up front. Uh, but the fact is, it's changing out there. It just is. Uh, CO2 levels in the atmosphere continue to rise uh, at a kind of staggering rate uh, compared to anything in the historical record. And temperatures, doesn't really matter how you want to measure them, temperatures keep going up too. Um, global averages, any kind of deviation from the norm. Uh, and of course, what that means for this industry is that uh, the ski season is getting shorter. Uh, it just is. Now, um, you can uh, debate this as much as you want in terms of causes. Um, I was recently on the uh, gondola at Jackson Hole, and I was riding with my son, my 15-year-old son. There were a bunch of other guys in there, sort of guys about my age, a little posse out for a boys' weekend or something. We got talking about the fact that one of the uh, companies that I work with in Sausalito, just north of San Francisco, they lost 20 days of time in their office this year because of flooding in the San Francisco Bay. Well, you know, that didn't happen 10 years ago. And a friend of mine who makes maple syrup back in Ontario, yeah, I'm still totally proud Canadian, by the way, bringing up maple syrup in my talk, um, he said, you know what, it's getting, it's getting earlier and earlier every year. They have to, the, the schedule is changing, and it's changing so fast they can see it year to year um, when they go out and they have to get the different equipment that they need um, to make the maple syrup. Now, we were sort of talking about this. It became clear that everybody in the gondola recognizes, yeah, it's happening. And I said, you know, being whatever, San Francisco guy, thinking everybody thinks the same way I do, I said, well, good thing it's just, you know, climate change is just a hoax from the Chinese, right? <laughs> guy looks right at me. He says, the temperature of this planet's been going up and down for billions of years, and this is no different. We get off the gondola. I say to my son, that there, that's a climate denier. But the difference is everybody knows it's happening now. And there's no point really in debating a whole lot with people who don't want to think that it's human caused. I think Protect Our Winners is great. I think everything that people are doing to slow and mitigate climate change is great. But the fact is the basic science of it is that CO2, once it's up in the atmosphere, doesn't dissipate for several decades, which means everybody in this room is going to be watching this planet warm for at least the rest of your professional lifetimes. That's just locked in. So it's shrinking. It's quite a setup, isn't it? So if that's all shrinking, but I'm here to talk about growth, what the hell? It's a bait and switch on Bruce, is that it? No, I'm here to talk about ways that maybe you can grow through it. So everybody knows about snowmaking, of course. This is a good way to sort of mitigate the beginning and the end. But let's face it, it doesn't work all that well when it's not cold. And uh, from everything I understand, it's hella expensive too. And it'll eat right into your, your annual revenue. So it's a, it's a great stopgap, but it doesn't always lead to the, the perfect ski experience either. We've all seen this late season, early season. It's not necessarily what we really want to see happen. Um, you know, the basic reality is it's going to get harder and harder to figure out how to get people to take that drive or fly to the mountains um, for the vacation that they want and that you want them to take. Now, I think part of the thing that's a little concerning when you're sitting deep in the industry is, of course, everybody thinks of the main asset in this industry as being geographic. It's the mountains themselves, uh, the mountains with these, these sort of incredible, iconic names associated with them. And by the way, it doesn't have to be the big names that we're used to that are on this slide. They can be the smaller names that are very familiar to people in local geographies. You know, those names are just as important. Um, and, and I would just argue for a second that these brands are probably an asset that is tremendously underutilized compared to what the big consumer brands do. So your, your, your brands all focus down in on specific geographies. These brands explode geography. And what they do is they deliver an experience in a whole pile of different geographies by making that experience, if not perfectly consistent, at least something that's recognizable. So they get incredible leverage out of this asset. So the ski industry, I can look at a sort of an iconic resort town like Banff. Um, oh, by the way, more of my Canadian cred, I spent one of the best summers of my life here in Banff working as a dishwasher at Melissa's Mistake, right down there downtown, if anybody's eating there. So how about that? <coughs> anyway, these are iconic, these are, it's an iconic town, it's iconic brands here. Um, but I grew up in Montreal, and this is where I grew up skiing. 
and uh, Montevilla here, Monse Sever, there's you know, no vertical drop to speak of, but for me, this is fantastic. This is, this is what introduced me to the sport, got me going. Me and my friends, we used to put on these, these white coveralls and we'd take magic markers and we'd call ourselves the ledge patrol. And that's getting a bit embarrassing now. But anyway, we did all that stuff and it, it really got us into the sport. And so of course we thought later as I got older and I could afford to, uh, going out west and skiing out west became a big deal. Um, so it's the classic feeder market, right? It's what so many of the sales and marketing professionals in the room want to have happen. It's, uh, it's behind a lot of the holding company acquisition strategies as well. But I'm just going to point out that if you look at this from a consumer product good point of view, it doesn't make any sense at all that there's no brand connection between any of these mountains. And it makes even less sense when you think about a bunch of these mountains being owned by the same holding companies. Now, I know that there's some attempt to do this through, obviously, this is the Mountain Collective, got the Vale Epic Pass, and then there's some other uh, attempts like that as well. Um, but I don't think it's taking advantage of something that could happen. Um, just because there's a Vale Resort in Colorado doesn't mean it's the only Vale. I mean, there could be a Vale Resort north of um, Vancouver, up in Whistler. Um, and I guess there's a new Vale Resort. Why isn't there Vale, Vermont? Um, you know, y'all know what Club Med would do. Y'all know what Four Seasons would do. They'd take a master brand and they would apply it to the experience all over the place. Now, in a climate change world, the feeder markets may start to look pretty different, right? You take a look at this. This is Buck Hill in Minnesota. And this is a master plan um, for effectively an artificial ski hill. Well, an artificial ski hill could be anywhere. Now, a lot of you right now are thinking, yeah, but that's not skiing. So just bear with me for a second, okay? Because this might be what feeder markets of the future look like. And you might want to extend brands out into these feeders so it's a little more clear that if you go to the effort of skiing at a place like this, it's because we want you to go to one of our more iconic resorts because, let's face it, the seasons are shrinking, but they're not going to disappear. Instead of having 100 days of skiing, you might have 70. This could be a feeder market. It could be. Right now, there's ski hills, artificial ski slopes that have been put up on landfills. You know how many abandoned landfills there are all over the U.S.? You could take the methane from the landfills, you convert that to natural gas, you could use the energy to run the lift. You could do that all over the US, you could do it in Alabama. So this might be the future of what an awful lot of skiing looks like for an awful lot of people. Boo, hiss. But the reality is you can do that 365, right? You can do that all the time. You have an opportunity, if you're willing to extend your brands out into these kind of environments, uh, to have touch points with your customers the same way that Starbucks does or McDonald's does. You can actually have an everyday kind of point of connection with your customers, which means from the point of your, uh, view of your business, you can have a much bigger business, a much bigger footprint, even if your customer's percentage of time spent on the actual ski slope is relatively small compared to what it is today. Now, you may say, that doesn't make any sense, dude. And, you know, to some extent, of course, it doesn't make a ton of sense, but I'm trying. Um, if you take in a brand like Alta, right? Everybody, I'm sure everybody knows Alta. It stands for a particular kind of experience. So if you're going to take an Alta brand, you're going to extend that into something that was less snow dependent. That could be a skate park. It could be a, a sort of an urban dry terrain park. It's not hard to manage what the, imagine what the amenities would look like. It's not hard to imagine what the feel is. At the same time, if you take Beaver Creek, you decide to apply that out into urban environments. Well, what's that going to look like? Probably more like an Equinox uh, fitness club. High end, very well, very well managed. Everybody's you know, um, having a good time and a sort of a level of luxury that's probably quite a little bit higher than what, um, what is the, uh, not, not exactly roughing it. I think that, is that, is that Beaver Creek or? Anyway, um, it's, it's not hard to imagine, right? The brand extension they can get from that is going to pull people back through to the mountain. But even if they don't ever go to the mountain, it doesn't really matter because the business has grown so much better. Now you think, okay, this is impossible, this isn't going to happen. But listen, climate change is going to force your hand. You're going to have to come up with something. In the same way that exploding land values kind of forced this on the golf business. They tried to figure out how do we get golf into an everyday experience for people so that they aspire to play it more than their municipal course, they want to go to Pebble Beach. And of course, you've got mini putt and you've got pitching putts all over the country. You've got all those executive golf things everywhere. That's a big business, and people have done very, very well off it. It's happening in surfing right now, too. Again, everybody thinks, well, surfing, no, you got to be in the ocean, you need the wave. But there are surf parks, artificial surf parks, popping up all over the world now. And these things are liberating surfing from the geographical constraints that they've been under. 
you literally can program some of these waves to imitate the experience that you've had in the ocean. It's not the same experience. And nobody's going to pretend it's the same experience, but it's going to get new surfers into the sport. It's going to get them hooked. And those are the people who are going to go after the real thing afterwards. Closer to home, I've had this experience in the cycling world. This is a Peloton bike. It's a stationary bike, sits in your home. You get a spin class streaming in off the tablet computer. Okay, so not only is this, you know, I mean, spin classes aren't real biking, first of all, right? Because you're not actually out there in the fresh air and doing all the thing. But there's probably more people who take spin classes on a daily basis than actually ride their bikes around, right? And this is one step removed because you're not even in the spin studio with everybody. You're in your basement or your garage or your second floor, but you're still getting the class to come in. So you're participating. And so here's this company that sort of rethought what biking is. Um, I'll show you the... So this is the map of when a, when a class goes out of the New York studio, there's people all over the country taking that class. Now, five years ago, people would have said, well, you know, that's impossible. But of course, technology advances very, very quickly and made this possible. And my little challenge to you guys is to think, OK, if you take nothing else away from this, how could you figure out how to make your resort brand relevant on a daily or weekly basis to people all over the country like this. Because if it can be done with biking, it can certainly be done with something around skiing or mountain travel. And once you've thought how to extend the experience out into people this way, whether it's through this technology or some other, you know where it's going to end up, because we all know. But I think that's tomorrow's panel. So I'll see you there. Thank you. <laughs>